Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sébastien Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, Michael Gronager. Uh, he is the CEO of uh, Chainalysis, and previously he was the COO of, uh, of Kraken, which is one of their main Bitcoin exchanges. I, 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 actually, I know Michael from a while ago. I think we met in Amsterdam uh, two years ago almost. And uh, he's been in a bit uh, on Reddit, and there's been a lot of controversy and news about uh, his service and, and something that happened there. So thanks very much for coming on today, Michael. Sure, you're welcome. So we're also meant to have Peter Todd on. Uh, he was going to ask a lot of very critical questions of Michael, but he's in San Francisco, and it, it seems like uh, he didn't manage to make it in time. So uh, we'll have to take on that role. Uh, but of course, we're we'll more than happy to do so. So yeah, I look for, I look forward to the discussion today. So um, to get started, can you just run us through briefly uh, what happened there? Yeah, sure, I can. Yes. Yeah. So so essentially, uh, a few months ago, we decided to to set up this uh, this experiment where we essentially wanted to see how easy it is to get. Uh, from transactions to contributors, what we wanted to do was essentially to do a, a map of what's, what, what's the movement of Bitcoin around the world. Uh, so, so what funds are moving from country to country in terms of Bitcoin. It's kind of an interesting exercise. Uh, but also, of course, in the long run, if you're doing compliance in different ways, what's interesting is, of course, origin of funds, because that would be a question that you get. So where did they come from? From which country did they originate? And also, you should, should acknowledge that there's some laws where there's actually some in some countries you are not allowed to trade with other countries and so on. So that's a question we would get at some point from from customers. So that's why we did a check up on this and first we meant to do a blog post and later on, essentially before we're doing anything, uh, announced announced that uh, that what we we're doing. So we set up uh, a carefully drafted experiment where we chose to do one uh, class C network. So uh, that would never uh, conflict with uh, a normal Bitcoin decline because that, that is protected uh, against that. And then we kept it running for a couple of months and uh, see what data it could collect. And also it becomes, of course, at some point uh, a honeypot. So uh, nodes would, would always connect to that one. And this means that we could get a pretty high, uh, pretty high estimate, uh, a pretty good estimate on from what country uh, a Bitcoin transaction originated. Uh, also, what what happened, and that's really what, con what, what was the cause of the controversy, was that Red Wallet apparently don't have this protection, and this meant that Red Wallet uh, were some of the Red Wallet instances were connecting directly to our servers, and we had well, as you're a startup, you're not always uh, doing everything uh, as good as you wanted to, so you uh, you we built in the way that we could monitor for transactions, but we didn't forward transaction. Uh, it should be said that all SPV clients have the same behavior. They don't forward transactions either, and you will find tons of different uh, behaviors in different clients around there. But it, our clients, uh, a note, caused uh, bread wallets, some bread wallet users to experience issues. That's it's highly unfortunate. And we only learned about that uh, Friday, I think, where uh, where we saw the posts on um, and Bitcoin talk and. Uh, some of the friends I know say, hey, you're, you're being mentioned here and there. And then uh, we looked into the issue and uh, shut down our service because we thought it was better to shut it down before we, we caused uh, anyone else's issue. And but why we weren't thought, you forwarding transactions? I'm curious. Why? Simply because the way that we set it up was that uh, it's much easier to have, uh, it requires a channel back to forward the transaction. So it would require, require some extra code writing and us to forward it. Uh, the way we set it up now, we are, we are serving blocks and Merkle blocks, so we are only uh, requesting data from, from uh, one local super instance, so to speak, and then we are not, uh, we are only sending back uh, the, the digest, uh, the country to, to transaction mapping once in a while, or that, that get, is getting pulled. So we don't really need to, to connect back and send the transaction forward. And it's not, well, it's not a demand that you do that, but of course it will annoy someone, especially if you're on a, on a bread wallet. 
So, uh, I mean, the main, the main sort of meat, I think, of today's discussion is also going to be uh, kind of looking beyond when we think about what does that mean when you have this transaction monitoring. I mean, you were talking about, for example, enforcing capital controls, which is obviously going to be something governments want, and it's obviously something that many people in the Bitcoin space are very much opposed to, because the very idea of Bitcoin for them and for many people is that it liberates one from that, right? So it, it, I think there's an interesting discussion there of very different views yeah. of what Bitcoin should do. Yeah. Um, but so it's I, also, yeah. Sorry, so just coming back to what happens here, I'm, I'm curious how you found out about uh, the sort of controversy that was happening on uh, Bitcoin Talk Forum and on Reddit and uh, how you uh, responded to it. Yeah, so I think I got a, I got a, a text, no, I got a message on Skype uh, Monday morning at some point where I was sitting and, and reading emails and uh, someone sent me a link to, to the discussion there on, uh, on uh, Bitcoin Talk. And then I went in there, discussed it with my CTO, CTO and then we essentially tried to find out what, what's actually heads and tails in this. What, what is uh, ups and downs? Is it, uh, is it uh, well... What are you being accused for, and what is actually the, the the problems here? First of all, it was not clear whether it was causing real issues for the Bitcoin network or not. So we needed to do some problem analysis before we uh, started to give back any feedback. And then from there, I chose to say, okay, the the proper source here is, is uh, I got in contact with two uh, two journalists, one from Inside Bitcoins, I think, and the other one from from uh, CoinDesk. And then I took the discussion with them because that would be related to to the highest number of people. And then later on, after we shut down the servers and so on, started answering questions on uh, on Bitcoin talk. So, um, digging a bit deeper in here, now Red Wallet connects to, does it just connect to some random node? And it was unlucky that in this case, uh, it was a node that was forwarding transactions. People would try to send transactions, but they would never be broadcast the network. Is that what happened here? Essentially, yes. However, the Bitcoin protocol works this way, or indirectly this way, that if you are on the network for a long time and you become popular, uh, then you, you grow and your ranking kind of grows indirectly. This means that a lot of other nodes are connected to you and they would send your IP to other ones. They would just forward it. And uh, that would essentially, in the, in the long run, that would mean that a lot of nodes would connect to you. So this means also that Red Wallet would, in the long run, connect to us. That's okay, but it's not okay if they only connect to us because then they wouldn't be able to forward that transaction. So normally they're pretty well connected, but for some reason, some of them, it could also be purely coincidental that they only got uh, had one of our, our nodes there. We did some, uh, some uh, code around that, so we, we'd never connect to, we simply drop a connection if the same nodes try to connect more than two times to us. So then we drop them. So yeah. if they had two connections and they were only to us, then they would be affected. So, so normally you would expect an SPV wallet to be connected to multiple nodes, uh, broadcast a transaction to multiple nodes, and then you know hopefully even if one of them doesn't forward it, it, it doesn't matter because some one other one does. But for some yeah. reason here, Bear Wallet only connected to one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, right. that, that's very interesting. I mean. One of the things we wanted to ask Peter, but I think uh, I'm sure it's also something uh, you can address here. Um, like you guys weren't malicious here, right? You weren't trying to stop red wallet users from buying their coffee or something. Uh, but what if, are there some kind of dangerous scenarios we see here that if somebody actually does want to do something malicious uh, and does, I don't know, instead of a few hundred nodes, get a few thousand nodes, and what what are the kind of risks here and dangers? What could someone do? I think definitely you could do that. And I, if you ask me, I would say that the Bitcoin network as it is today is probably too vulnerable against these these kind of things. So we we have been into Bitcoin for a long time, and we did best effort to do any everything in the right way. And as it is a very heterogeneous network today. We didn't knew all the implementations and all the details in all the wallets, so it meant that we, we unfortunately uh, caused issues for some other people. Other nodes are causing issues from other people again, and that's just how it works. It means that we need to build clients in the future expecting that stuff like this would happen, expecting other kind of attacks. And as I see it today, my main worry is 
as the, the trading grows and as you see reactions on different things, let's say you want to earn some money in Bitcoin. So what do you do? You buy a few, a few uh, let's say a few thousand nodes. You set up a network similar to ours. Uh, and then at, at the right time, you say, now I buy a lot of Bitcoins. Uh, no, you don't. Now you sell, a, you sell a lot of Bitcoin, you go short on them. And then you switch them off or switch them on essentially, so they don't, for, don't forward transaction anymore, they cause a lot of problems on the network, you would see a lot of issues because you might even have, have a, a coin sp a split forks for a while, other, other kind of, of ugly things because they were essentially the, became the new backbone of the Bitcoin network. And then the price will drop because people usually react to it that, that way. You go in there, you buy some coins, and you go back again and then you have earned some money on that one. You definitely you could definitely do stuff like that, and it's not it's not good because it, it's just the way things are today. Yeah, no, it's interesting because uh, just uh, two episodes ago, three, we talked about the idea of shorting Bitcoin, especially in the long run, and what yeah. kind of risks will there be, especially if you're able to take a very large short position, and then some financial players can come in with large resources, uh, and and. What's interesting is that we sort of assumed in all that discussion uh, a kind of a best case scenario for Bitcoin. Assume, you know, what are the risks if somebody actually has to like acquire control of a majority of the hashing power, right? But that, of course, is an absolute um, best case scenario for the security of Bitcoin. And even then, there are risks. But an attacker probably doesn't even have to do that, can have their many, many uh, way cheaper attacks. Uh, cheaper ways to cause I think you, yeah, it would be through a botnet. That's obvious. It could be through a botnet to set up. And, and the normal mitigation that, that exchanges uses, if someone tried to manipulate price, they actually have compliance officers that go through all trades. And, and they, that would also happen in, for example, there was this case on, on uh, Wall Street a few years ago where someone hacked a Twitter account for, from a prominent source and managed to make uh, some indexes go down 1 or 2%. There's a lot of money, and what you look at there is that who earned from this? And then you scrutinize every single person and figure out who could it be that was the, of the cause of the problem. That would never happen in Bitcoin. There's no central organization, any control, anything there. So you're home free doing it. You can essentially do it as a happy hacker, and then you can just uh, uh, go there, get up your botnet running, and, and earn some money on the exchanges. And the normal mitigations, looking into each transaction and figure out, uh, or each trade and figure out who earned a lot from this, who actually had the magic bill that knew when the, when the price would go down, that, that kind of, of things would never happen. And I think it should before, it, 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 it's something that, that we need to, to, that exchanges would need to do at some point. Uh, I mean, one, one related point to that also is the question, to what extent is it illegal, right? So when you, when you hack a Twitter account, uh, and make some fake tweet, impersonate someone, yeah, obviously that's illegal. But when you uh, hire a lot of nodes and don't forward transactions and stuff, well, that may be against uh, sort of expected behavior of Bitcoin. It may be against uh, what people want to do, maybe against some sort of standards, but it's hardly illegal or probably not. I mean, it's it's hard to know, but uh, it's... It, should be very possible there to do attacks that are perfectly legal. So you can't even, I think even if you identify the people, there may be no recourse you can take. I think the only recourse you can take is if they do it for, price manipulation is illegal, and it's illegal in, in almost all jurisdictions. So, okay. so as long as you can pinpoint that and clearly make the case that this person uh, deliberately tried to do price manipulation and you earned like one million bucks on that one. Then, then you can definitely do take legal actions on that part. If someone is doing whatever experiment, doing even just trying to, not to, to just for the fun of it, because they like Litecoin better than Bitcoin, try to do a, a DDoS attack on the Bitcoin network, you couldn't do anything about it. Not as I see it. It wouldn't be, it would be impossible to 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 uh, to run that case in in a in a legal way. Now, but you talk about price manipulation, but I mean, uh, price manipulation on what? On, on regulated assets? I mean, I don't think Bitcoin falls into the category of something that would uh, fall under uh, price regulate price manipulation. Uh, you might be right. Law, you might be right. right. Yeah. yeah. 
Today's magic word is duality. D U A L I T Y. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Um, so, so, taking a step back, you mentioned a little bit about the, the kind of goals you are pursuing with chain analysis. You know, that, for example, you gave the example of uh, capital controls, uh, but can you expand a little bit on what's the. Um, uh, what are the objectives of the company? So essentially, I talk to uh, to bankers uh, in different countries for a few years, well, last year essentially, and to, to regulators as well and so on, and uh, also in trying to obtain bank accounts and, and having these discussions. Uh, CoinDesk ran, ran a long feature around the, why it's so hard for Bitcoin companies to, um, to get a bank account. And also... Uh, I've been running, lately been running uh, compliance courses as well, and uh, I get approached by, by uh, compliance officers from, from banks, and they say, well, we, we actually would like to onboard Bitcoin, but we don't have any measures to, we don't have any tools to, to do, our, do our customer due diligence. We don't know, uh, we don't have any way to, act, to actually uh, apply the, to the law, follow the law uh, regarding anti-money laundering and other things. So essentially, what the only thing we would be able to do would be either keep an extremely low amount of Bitcoin, but even that would, would cause a, a liability if they accepted that. So they don't really know how to treat Bitcoin and not cause, uh, cause liabilities for themselves. So that's why there was definitely a, a requirement for different tools to help them do that. Uh, so one thing, for example, if you look to, to US, um, there are the, the OFAC lists of uh, individuals you're not allowed to, to trade with. There's also companies you're not allowed to, to, to do uh, transactions with, and there are even countries you're not allowed to do that. And the, the repercussions, if you do it anyway, are pretty hard. Uh, and, this, and this means that if you, for example, accepted a Bitcoin transaction from, uh, say, uh, North Korea or Afghanistan or wherever, uh, one of the countries on, on that list, uh, and that was used uh, for some kind of terror uh, attack, you're pretty certain that you would go probably go to jail for, for doing so, unless you could state a story where you could say, I actually did my best to check that that was not the case. And then the question is, how do we establish what is the best? And the best is the best by industry standards. And early on, when we had discussions with regulators in US, there was a lot of people, developers, all the core developers and so on, claimed, well, we shouldn't be regulated as, as uh, hard as cash because Bitcoins are actually traceable. They're much more traceable than cash. And uh, that was the expectation from regulators from early on. They also talked to, to Nadja uh, from, from uh, CSFF in, in Luxembourg, uh, the regulator there, and, and she also heard the same story and approached me last year and said, hey, but you always claimed that Bitcoins were, were much easier to trace than cash. Uh, I heard that from all people. So, so this also means that we need some tools. We actually need to be able to, to utilize this, uh, this uh, feature of Bitcoin if we are not to regulate them as cash. And if they were to re be regulated completely, 100% as cash, it would be impossible to know what's the origin of, of funds, and you would need a lot of statement from users, and the utility of, of Bitcoin in that scenario would be awful because you wouldn't be able to use them in... in it would be very hard to integrate them in the existing banking system. Of course, you could use them for other purposes, but, but that would be mainly for, for, for medium of barter, and they can be used for that as well. You raised another question just before uh, around uh, would you still, well, if, if you have this uh, kind of, of knowledge around the region of funds and other things, would you suddenly... Um, be locked out. Some people couldn't use certain exchanges, or you could state that if you used a Tom, I couldn't use an exchange or whatever. Whatever you use in Bitcoin, I don't see that you can still trade Bitcoins with everyone in, in the Bitcoin environment. But if you want to go to fiat land, and if you actually want to, to go to one of the exit and entry points in, in the, of Bitcoin, then they are under a lot of, of regulations. They, they have to follow a lot of rules. And if you don't want to accept that they are they have to follow these rules you're essentially just asking them to take your risk just saying well I don't care I just expect you to take to, to run that risk 
and, and don't check anything on me because I don't want you to, to do that. And they will just end up in jail at some point because at some point some, some money launder guy would actually end up there and they would get a case against them. Yeah, I, I, don't, don't, think that, I, don't, I don't think that you, you're only concerned when you're interacting with fiat. I mean, mm -hmm. you could also be concerned when interacting in the Bitcoin uh, payment system itself. And so the, the question that we had for you is like, does this sort of labeling of clean and dirty coins uh, threaten the fungibility of Bitcoin where we now have a situation where some coins are uh, coins non grata and are not accepted by uh, major exchanges or perhaps even merchants? Yeah, so what I see is that, that uh, at least in our view, in our way of implementing uh, solutions for, for uh, compliance solutions, we don't like the idea at all of, of uh, red lists, black lists, white lists of, of coins. We see uh, and, and that's how compliance works. You need to, to look at the story around a transaction. So I have this uh, uh, favorite example. Let's say you go into a bank and you have a, a million dollars with you. You're a new customer. You, they've never seen you before. And you say, I just want to deposit these million dollars in cash. They'll probably say, no, we can't do that. Or if they do, would, they would definitely file a suspicious activity report on you and, and uh, because they would, they would feel that we don't know the written of funds. It's not clear in any way that this guy should, should pop up with $1 million. The, the, the dollars are still fungible even though you couldn't put them in there. You would still be able to take the dollars one by one and buy grocery or whatever for them. That would be totally okay, but moving $1 million into a bank account would be impossible. The other scenario would be that you have been, uh, you're the, the head of uh, Red Cross. You're doing a collection in your community and you're getting a lot of, uh, you are out in the streets and uh, getting a lot of money for, as donations. Your bank knows that. He knows your history. You still, you come in with a million dollar again. Then you could still put the million dollar in there. So it's not the dollars and, and the, the, the coins in Bitcoin land that became tainted. It would be the story around them. So, so uh, I don't see a scenario where I, if you end up with certain coins, you can't get rid of them again. But if you end up with certain coins in huge amount, it will definitely be hard to do it. So let's say that you, for some reason, chose uh, to uh, switch Litecoin with Bitcoin for the everything that the latest hacker at Bitstamp got out there. Then you might have some issues getting getting rid of them afterwards because it would be a huge amount. But if you had smaller amounts from the Bitcoin hacker at at uh, Bitstamp last uh, latest time, you probably not see any issues. Some some institutions might raise a flag because they, they found out that there was this trail of the money. But if it was only smaller amounts and you had a good history and a good record otherwise, I don't see that there would be any reason for them to, to think that there was anything dodgy going on. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, it's, a, it's an interesting question that you brought up, Sebastian. And it's kind of, a, it's hard to wrap your head around this sometimes, right? So. On, on what kind of level does the monitoring and, and, and this happen? Does it happen on a user level, on a transaction level, or on a coin level? And, and I mean, I think it's, it's definitely the case, in my view at least, and I think in the view of most people, almost everyone in the Bitcoin community, that the idea to ha have it on the coin level, it, it just makes no sense, right? I mean, that, that, that would be a total uh, disaster. Yeah. Um, yeah, right, also uh, it would be awful because it would essentially mean if you had a, a, a central repository of, of uh, different colors of coins, then you would, for each transaction, even, sm even smaller transaction, you would need to go central to, in order to, to maintain it. And it's just not in the spirit of Bitcoin and it's not the, the things you want. You just want to, to, uh, to be able to, well, like the normal dollars, you can turn them over from between two different people and that's okay. So uh, can you explain a bit uh, how you would conduct these analysis? So to, to say like this is, uh, you know, this is okay. Uh, maybe a bank can take on uh, this money or an exchange can take on this money except this deposit versus uh, there is some sort of some flag here. Does that mean you would, for example, as a company, you would keep a track of, let's say, stolen coins and things like that, or or how would that work? So essentially, 
we, we, we don't like to have the liability as a company of, of uh, claiming what is good or bad. Uh, that's essentially up to the user to upload that to us and then they can reuse what they got afterwards. Uh, if they wanted to collaborate somehow on, on sharing between them, they could do that as well. But that's really something they, they choose to do and we don't choose to do. Uh, if you would, it would definitely be good to, to have a list of stolen coins and, and also what we have in, in, uh, at many exchanges and so on, a lot of people are doing fraud there, so they would show up with a, a credit card that's false or, or stolen or whatever and go Bitcoin and then run away. And I think there's a, definitely a, a exchange that would like to avoid that and if, they, if it happens to them, they see it as people stealing money from them and that's actually what happened. So they would like these money not to be easily laundered on other exchanges so they'd probably tell other exchanges and, and everyone that this was the case. You see it all the time with big Bitcoin, ha Bitcoin hacks. Everyone are keen to tell these are actually stolen. Please don't take them or please tell me where they are. So, so that's, uh, that's part of it. What we are doing uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of for, for, the, for our customers, you need to, to look at compliance as a bigger thing. So essentially you have a customer and around that customer is a lot of different data. So what they need to, to have to, to have a customer today would probably be to have a passport, it could be vetted, it could also, it could, might even be only a Bitcoin address. They definitely have your IP address, they would do that all the time. Today, any, any company into financial services, also the Bitcoin companies, would check your IP address, they would check where you log in from, do you log in from different sources, and depending on the pattern of use, what you do, uh, and so on, uh, if you, for example, only go from from uh, Bitcoin to fiat, they might not be that worried. If you go from fiat to Bitcoin, they would worry more because uh, fiat land is known for, for easy fraud. So they might actually try to exit with Bitcoin. So different things would apply there, and that would be the whole picture of that that would weigh in on them to figure out whether this was risky or not. So what we can provide extra there is essentially to see on the Bitcoin side of things. So if they receive some Bitcoin or if they're sending Bitcoin somewhere, then they, we can help them see, okay, is this the same wallet that is being, that were being used at an earlier fraud case on our exchange? Because we don't want the same guy to pull the same number at us twice. And the only thing they can do today in, in the simple way is just to, to look for the same address. And uh, that doesn't help much. What we can help them with is the clustering part, uh, to cluster things together into wallets. I'm not saying that this can't be tricked or whatever, I'm just saying that what you need to do to do your compliance is to do the best stuff available. And best stuff available today is not to just look at single addresses, it's probably to look at, at the at, at wallet level and at least ensure that's a part of it. You could also look at the, the specific user, what's kind of their pattern and other things, so different things in that that uh, that scenario would be what we are we are providing. Uh, well, let's uh, let's come back to this in just a second. I want to talk about user protection as well. I mean, um, come back to this attack scenario because I think there's some other topics that that, uh, that would be interesting to talk about. Uh, before we do that, let's talk about. Uh, Shapeshift. So uh, Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to buy and sell altcoins. Uh, if you ever tried to buy altcoins on an exchange, you know, we've been talking about exchange, you know that that is somewhat complicated. You have to create an account there, send them a bunch of personal information, uh, and um, you know that just takes a lot of time and it's, it's sort of a hassle. Shapeshift makes it easy with their currency conversion tool. Looks a lot like Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. Um, so basically, uh, you go to shapeshift.io, you choose the currency you want to deposit, and you choose the currency you want to deposit to. If you have a look here, uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, you'll see that they support about, about two dozen different currencies, including uh, Dogecoin, Feathercoin, Newbits, uh, Potcoin, if you're into that, <laughs> Ripple, and uh, recently, Unobtainium. Um, I'm still not sure what that is, but yeah. they do it's, support. It's finally obtainable. I do support unobtainium. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you, you go to shapeshift.io, you enter the uh, address of the currency you want to convert to. Uh, so in this case, for instance, we want to buy some Litecoin from Bitcoin. You put your Litecoin address, uh, you hit start, 
you will uh, be shown a QR code to which you will send your Bitcoin, and in just a few seconds, you'll get Litecoin in your account. Or it could be someone else's account. It could be um, could be a merchant that you're sending it to. It could be someone you're tipping. You know, there's really lots of possibilities here. And what's really great as well is they're adding uh, some interesting tools to their um, to their toolkit. So one tool that uh, we've talked about recently is the shape shift the shape the shifty button, uh, rather, which um, it's kind of cool, so it allows you to just basically add a button to your website. So if you've got a Bitcoin address, in our case, on our tipping page, we've got a Bitcoin address. We used to have a bunch of different wallet addresses there for Litecoin and Dogecoin, etc. But we got rid of all those, and we just added the shifty button. And with one uh, single button, people can now tip us with up to 25 different altcoins, whatever the amount of coins they support us. So uh, go to shiftshift.io, give it a try, uh, tell us what you think. It's uh, really fast and easy and it doesn't require any personal information to be given to them. You don't even need to create an account. And uh, so we'd like to thank ShipShift.io for the support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So coming back to... Was that a commercial? I just need to ask. Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I probably should have mentioned that beforehand. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, we do. We, we do have sponsors. We like to choose them wisely. We, we work with sponsors that uh, that uh, we, we believe in, and so Shapeshift is one of those companies that we think is providing real value to the community and to the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole. So we, uh, we like them, and so we advertise for them. Uh, so yeah, coming back to uh, to just briefly to the civil attack. So. Uh, we we mentioned the you know, who was affected by this. So in one instance, uh, bread wallet users were affected by this. Uh, now, a lot. Of, so we've been talking about SPV wallets recently. We had uh, Toma from Electrum on. Um, Electrum is an SPV wallet, but uses a different scheme. So there's servers that are sort of somewhat centralized, and the transactions go through there. It's not like a I guess what you would call a, a true implementation of SPV, where it connects directly to Bitcoin nodes. Um, like. What percentage would you uh, would you say uh, of Bitcoin users would be directly affected by this um, if someone were to try to implement like a large scale attack uh, vector where they had maybe like 10,000 nodes on the network? And to what extent would the Bitcoin network be paralyzed if that were to happen? Uh, so, I mean, what would what would be the so say we had 10,000 fake nodes on the network? How would that uh, affect the network uh, in a practical sense? It's actually a good question. I think that, that what would be affected would be uh, people trying to buy beer in cafes uh, and uh, whatever use of, of smaller SPV wallets. I think that would be the prime, the prime uh, victims in the first place. The question is how bad it would be for the real Bitcoin network if you would get some nodes that would event, effectively become disconnected. And be well falling behind. For, so my for question is then, so that that's it then. So it, it's only those SPV wallets that would be affected, or would, could we uh, expect the network to just generally be slow and sluggish and transactions not making it to the miners for some reason? I think actually the latter. I think that could happen if you really do a, a full uh, a real civil attack on on the Bitcoin network. That would definitely be uh, something you could do. Um, it's not good, but that would be the case. So then my next question is, how do you think uh, the Bitcoin network as a whole can protect itself from this sort of attack? Um, Ooh, there's I'm, one thing, the one way it's protected already today is that miners connect directly to each other. So, so the mining would still go on. Uh, the other thing is that I'm, I, might assume, I might guess that some of the bigger players would also connect directly to the mining network. And this means this is a kind of a centralization, you could say, because that, that's uh, uh, not a peer-to-peer -peer thing. Is someone agreeing that we do it this way because we are important and, and we do it, we want quality of, of, uh, of service. So they would not be affected either. Uh, the ones being affected would be, well, people on, on a normal client and, and uh, other ones running, running that scenario there. And they would most likely be, uh, either they would get see that they didn't get blocks fast enough, they would have problems getting their transactions conf confirmed. And then at some point, I guess that they would see that something was wrong and try to restart. And once restart notes, they would go to the 
to the to these uh, seed sites, and some of them actually are run by Bitcoin Core, another centralization part. Uh, and this means that they would get some of the the nodes that would act would actually give them their the right connection to the network, and they would be back again. So it would cause some annoyance, definitely. Uh, the core part of the network being the miners would probably not be affected at all. Okay. And uh, how can so on? So that's I guess on the uh, network security uh, side, the security the security of the network as a whole. Uh, as far as users go, how so? What what your what your research is doing is is uh, uh, aggregating uh, IP and location data from users. If I'm if I'm a user of the Bitcoin network and I uh, and I want to protect myself uh, against this type of uh, what some may consider to be invasion of my privacy. I'm not saying that's particularly my case, but uh, how could one protect uh, oneself against this type of? Uh, I think that what you should, you should do, you should go through the Tor network. That would be uh, the right way to do it. If you really want anonymity, I think that has been a well-known fact in, in uh, among Bitcoin core people, at least for a while, that, that the only way you can protect you against Stuff like that would be going to Tor uh, and run your transaction and send them to Tor. You could say that in our setup, the only thing that we would gain, gain there that would be that this is a Tor transaction. So that's a big country of Tor, which is good enough. We don't, we don't, uh, we definitely have no intention whatsoever to try to to look into where where things come from inside the Tor network, and, and that would be, I think that's that's uh, what applies for everyone. So so. Um, so but that then would be it. I, I presume you would have, uh, for example, an exchange or some bank, etc. They would say, "Oh, uh, a, a transaction coming from Tor then is uh, suspicious." Probably. Perhaps, perhaps it's hard to tell. Today, a lot of transactions come from Tor network as well, a Tor exit nodes, uh, and that doesn't mean that they're they're suspicious uh, either. But you could say that if they see that this is from the Tor network. Again, it, it all adds, adds up to to, uh, to the entire uh, entire picture of this customer and this uh, specific transaction. So it's not just either or. So if you have one customer that only sends you money as a bank through Tor, you would probably say, "I need to ensure that this guy is actually who he claims he is," before you accepted that in the long run, because you would feel that I have, don't have this extra kind of info telling me that he is telling the truth. So you would probably say, okay, is he really from, is he really the guy who he thinks he is? So you look at an extra time as his passport, you might call him and say, hey, uh, it's you, we just saw you send all everything to Tor. It's perfectly okay with us, but well, we just want to know that you're there. We pick up the phone when, when, when we call you. And they say, yeah, it's me. I just like privacy. You say, okay, cool. I think that would be, be the, the normal scenario around that. The other set some, is that some you, may consider that to be some sort of an intrusion uh, and uh, uh, you know some sort of mass surveillance of, of what people do. So uh, you know, the other side of that, uh, and what I think sort of the, the spirit of Bitcoin is that we don't have to have that sort of um, that sort of uh, how, assumption of guilt, uh, in, in some might call. I don't think it's it's a, an assumption of guilt that way. It, it's more like well, I think essentially the Bitcoin, Bitcoiners, a lot of, at least what I've seen the last few days, there's definitely an assumption of guilt up front. <laughs> so so uh, that's the, what I have seen. But but uh, I, I think that if we assume guilt, if you don't, you don't see that we necessarily assume guilt here just by checking up on people things. Also, if you're a financial institution, following the, the law, you need to do it. And what you could choose to do is that you could either not check these things and just do extra uh, extra KYC on your customers and do other things that in the normal space, or you could take a higher risk and risk getting out of business because you got a fine at some point. That's essentially the three scenarios you have. So you can either make it a very uh, very low low uh, low friction uh, user path. Use different products to to make to make a good guess whether people are actually are good or bad, and for that purpose you need a lot of data points. That's one way you could say you are inviting invading privacy, but you could also state that on your site that that that's your policy. That's how you are checking up on people. That's why you are so good at it. 
The other version, number two, is that you say, I just ensure totally upfront that I know who I'm dealing with, so people can't get an account here unless they meet up in person. Uh, and then you would also have done your due diligence in a good way. And then afterwards, you're not checking anything electronically. The third, third option is you just take the risk. You just say, okay, I'm an exchange, I'm perfectly okay with that, I take the risk. But again, that would just be market, uh, different market forces, choose, and you as a user could choose different, uh, different schemes there and different exchanges. As, as an exchange provider or as a financial service, it's up to you to choose what kind of, of, uh, of risk profile or scenario you prefer. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, dark wallet or, or mixers. Uh, what kind of role do you see for that in the future? And um, I, I mean, I also presume, right, when you uh, when if you use those and you start to interface with uh, with banks or regulated companies, that that would raise uh, that would probably be a problematic way of using it, right? Or, or I guess it would add, it would be one factor that. Yeah, I well, I could give her a two penny advice, and that would probably be that use your mixer against the already legal services that you need to interact with, and try to use something that looks more well, okay if you're interacting with with banks. That would probably be the best way. So, if you're dealing with if you want to buy something on Silk Road, it's not there anymore, but if you want to do stuff like that, then it would be through a mixer. or So you didn't get your, your kind of, of history to change it. Still, you would be able to see you'd use the mixer, I think. But uh, again, it's, I, would, I would go for, for that, that scenario. Otherwise, I say, what, what would be the role of mixers? Well, you could say that they're... They are still there. The problem is that you are you are definitely trying to obfuscate something, and depending on on the policy of a financial institution, they can choose to say this is this is there's a good reason for that, or they could say that we don't see a good reason for that, so that's why we think it's suspicious that you're trying to obfuscate what you're doing, and then we choose to to do something about it, whatever that can be. Uh, it's hard to say what what will be the specific uh, choices there. So, uh, what's your personal view on this? Do you think um, mixers uh, and, and dark wallet and those kind of projects are a good thing for Bitcoin, or do you think it would be more desirable if those didn't exist because it would make it easier maybe to get acceptance from uh, any integration in existing financial services? I think that I think we will see. Now we have this this era where we try to get Bitcoin kind of. Uh, legal, get, get it, well, mainstream being Bitcoin to some extent. Uh, I think that it will not, Bitcoin being mainstream would not be, mean at the same time that all the other cryptocurrencies will, will go mainstream at the same time. So it depends on, on what, what level of, of, uh, of compliance tools and other things you can build around them. And uh, if you build stuff like zero coin and other things, I think that would be even harder. So, so they don't have this story I referred to earlier saying that, well, we are, we are much uh, more traceable than cash. No, they're really cash. Uh, you can't trace them at all. This means that you need a lot more uh, in, the, in the banking sector, you would need a lot, lot more due diligence around customer, uh, taking, onboarding customers and so on. That would probably hinder the, the acceptance of, of stuff like that. I have to say that's a it's a really interesting perspective and, and it's a perspective that I, I don't think I've heard before, right? To to think of um of these services, right, like like mixers or these anonymity services. Uh if you think of those from the perspective of the banks or, or, or of those sort of let's call them regulated entities that you know bridge between fiat and, and Bitcoin. There, they just create uh, additional work, right? Because uh, they, they make yeah. they make the compliance harder, uh, and then that's that's very interesting, right? So, uh, of course, I, I, my thinking on this has often been: it, it's really important that people can stay very anonymous, because uh, to the extent that, let's say, law enforcement or, or other entities are able to, for example, de-anonymize. Uh, all Bitcoin users, or like Bitcoin users to a large extent, most Bitcoin users, you know, it's a threat on on a few levels, right? Like you can, 
uh, if you don't like Bitcoin, if a company wants to ban Bitcoin, it can go against Bitcoin users directly, uh, and you know it, it can make it make Bitcoin less attractive because potentially you know huge privacy risks. Um, Yeah, I, I should add that, that I definitely would see that as a nightmare scenario if you try to de-anonymize uh, all Bitcoin users and all their transactions. Uh, for example, take there was a leak uh, earlier this year, and there was one last year from Van Gogh's, and there was another leak uh, just recently where someone leaked the, the user database. And if you take these new leaks and put them together, you have the entire transaction history for, for all the users that were ever signed up on Gox. That's kind of a leak that says something about privacy. If you go in there, you can find all transactions. You need a bit of work to do it, but you can do it. And that's bad. And, and uh, that's kind of the, the, that would be a horror scenario. So imagine that you could do that with Bitcoin and it would be possible. So not only would it be done by, by some weird government agencies, it would also uh, happen by that someone else would do it and suddenly it would be just out in the open and it would not, the value of Bitcoin would disappear because, well, if anyone could see what any, everyone was buying, I think that's for perhaps one of the issues with Ripple, that as soon as you transact with one guy once, then you can see what he's buying all the time. That's one of the issues, and, and you don't want that to happen with Bitcoin. You essentially want to see that, well, don't mind, you can see everything what's happening on the network as a, on a statistical level, but you don't like to well, share every sin single purchase that you made. But do you, do you think this is a, a plausible scenario? Or is that a danger you worry about? I don't think that we will have... No, I don't think so. I think it's too hard. Still, it, again, if you're trying to, to do the, the, the de-anonymization through, through uh, IP addresses, it's hard to get a very a, a complete coverage of things anyway. You could probably pinpoint uh, down to some, to some level. But then again, you would have a run into other problems. You would see that people use different IP addresses. They are different, uh, different in many ways. So just example that you have IP addresses for different, uh, using a mobile phone, then you would change IP address all the time. So, so you would have these kind of scenarios and that just, it's not that easy. Again, the, we have Tor, so if you really need to be private, then you would use that as well. And, if if uh, it, it will be uh, well a war on tech, so if you have more of, of more tools of that degree, people probably start to use Tor more often, I think. But I think perhaps Tor would would have the same issue. You could probably de, de anonymize that as well if you really made a huge effort and, and run simple attacks there. We don't like that either. It, it's 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 uh, I don't see any point in doing so. Uh, well, I, I think so. We get into some sort of a scenario where people that have the technical ability to uh, to use Tor and to use anonymizers would have uh, relatively good anonymity and privacy, and people that don't um, would would uh, would be vulnerable to having their uh, yeah their their identity and their anonymity be compromised. I mean, to some extent, it's probably um, also uh, true about. General technology, um, yeah. Well, so, can you talk a little bit about where where you see Bitcoin going? What kind of role do you see Bitcoin taking in a few years from now? How will this be integrated into existing systems or used on the side, or like, what's your vision for Bitcoin? So, essentially, as I see it, is that. Initially, when I saw Bitcoin first time, I saw that this is just awesome because what you have here is, is uh, online cash. And I've never been a huge fan of, of uh, paying through watching different kind of commercial ads on, on the internet. So I essentially always prefer to well, pay for services in, in smaller transactions and whatever way you need to do it. So I think that there's definitely a case in the future. We need some different developments, uh, completely separate from, from what we're doing on, on micropayments and other things. But I think we will use Bitcoin as cash online. That will open up for the entire third world to be able to trade with us. All the unbanks suddenly become, will be able to, to be included in our economy. And that's kind of a revolution as I see it. So just that part is a revolution by itself. When we are there, then we are, start, we are moving into the completely speculative uh, scene. And for, for, before getting there, I think we need to have Bitcoin mainstream. So it means that, well, 
your bank, your everyone would just accept that Bitcoin is is uh, another medium of exchange, something you can use for to pay with, and that's perfectly okay. That would include a lot of other players in our economy, and that would be awesome. So if you go from there and and ahead, then you can only speculate. But some people would would speculate that we will see a, an era where well, you only have cryptocurrencies. It would be no point in, in, in keeping fiat currencies around. That might be the case. And that would be, well, I think probably be cool, but it's just too, too far in the future, so I can't really dream that far. I think that first step, as I see it, and the first goal is that if we have, we have a technology at hand here by which we can include the unbanks, we can include the third world, they can become part of our economy, and we can also, as individuals, we can have an app store on the entire internet where we can choose to buy for smaller services and get rid of, of all these strange subscriptions you need to do here and there and just well, use Bitcoin instead. Cool. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I, I agree, but I, I also think that it's important that we try to, as much as possible, protect ourselves against the sort of things that you know the financial system has been uh, um, accused of in, in, in recent years and uh, that we try to uh, make sure that whatever this whatever happens in the future with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency uh, is in the interest of just the people in general right I mean um, I totally agree I think one, one of the best, the worst scenario the really bad scenario we had in banking I, I whatever you, you can say about banking they can earn as much as they want and they can do whatever they want but I think what we had the worst nightmare scenario we had the last few years had been too big to fail. So it's not really bad that a bank does a lot of Ill illegal things and in the end they go to jail and they go bankrupt. So that's how the system should work. It's not a big deal. I, I wouldn't even get offended in any way by them doing it. They probably do it. But the bad thing is that if they do a lot of bad things and you get a scandal like HSBC that been participating in money laundering, on the level of, of several, mil, uh, several billion euros and at the same time you end up saying well they're too big to fail you can't put them in jail they'll get a fine and that's it it's not okay that's bad we don't want that to happen in Bitcoin we don't want a future, future like that so I totally agree there so with this whole uh, I guess you probably call it some, some sort of a fiasco but with this whole ordeal that you've been through uh, these last couple of days, um, you know, I was reading through the Bitcoin Talk forum and we were you know, following on Reddit. What, what have you learned from this experience, from uh, being sort of, uh, uh, I guess, a, a target of, of the Bitcoin community? Um, so I think that I think there's uh, two things. I think. Um, the main outcome, what, what we learn from is it that is that if you want to do surveillance, you should probably do it uh, even in more stealth mode. Still, I think that was not really our purpose on things. What we wanted to do was to to uh, to build this uh, this transaction, the block around transfer of fund between between countries, and I think we shaped our experiment pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, some users got hit on on black bread wallet, and that was bad. Uh, what we perhaps also should do is to say that this is a legitimate use. There is a, a use case in what we're doing there. So perhaps you should advertise it. I suggested that on one of the Bitcoin talk posts that you could, for example, just state out frankly in, in the link that this is the running the statistics at why we are here. And uh, then you could be able to see that in, in uh, some of the messages you post that this is the kind of node you are connecting to now. Um, that's one of the discussion points, takeaway points from that. Aside from that, I think we expected all, all the time when we went from, from doing a normal coding stuff and went into the compliance thing of Bitcoin, we definitely expected to have discussions on whether that was a good idea for Bitcoin or not, whether that was the way Bitcoin should move. Is it an idea? Is it, is it totally wrong? Are what we are doing unethical to, do, to, to help financial services uh, being able to, to uh, administer the risk uh, in dealing with Bitcoin? Is that wrong? Should we completely keep it uh, pure crypto land or whatever? I, I think that that kind of discussion will be ongoing and will for for a long time, and will probably also get some some bashing bashing for that part. So I, I think you said something quite interesting there, and what I'd like to add is that, so there's sort of an expectation of transparency uh, in in the ecosystem, and an expectation of um, 
uh, I know the word in French, but you know, like uh, sh uh, showing showing your hands. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what 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 I'm trying to say there, but oh, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. So uh, showing your cards, right? Um, yeah. And perhaps one thing that one may want to consider doing when doing analysis like this on the blockchain or any sort of large-scale uh, operation is to you know put it out there beforehand. It's like yeah, okay, yeah, go right. on the forums and say like we're going to do this. Uh, so by the way, yeah. if, if if you're trying to protect yourself against this sort of an attack, you can block these IP addresses rather than letting people like talk about it for four or five days and then finding out that you know your IP addresses belong to your company and then. Uh, and then c finally coming out and saying, "Yeah, this is us." So perhaps uh, this is uh, one one of the lessons to be learned, and uh, to I others who may want to yeah, engage in the right. future would, would uh, have that behavior. But, it's it's but, delicate. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. The only thing is that it's delicate because if you're building a business, to some extent, you also don't want competitors to pick up the same ideas. You go in this kind of little uh, stealth ball initially, and you build your ideas and and want to say, "Okay, when we're ready to present this for the world, we'll do it." But in this specific case, it's probably better to, to go well, show show clearly clearly what your your intent is up front. I agree. But I, I think you know this discussion has been very interesting, and I think it is very interesting if we look at, for example, there was the, the response of Mycelium on Reddit, and you know, they talked about how they are building all these tools that you know are meant to really make Bitcoin more anonymous by default. So for example, they say coin join will be implemented by default in the future. I think they want to go through Tor. Uh, I guess also by default or something like that, uh, and, and you know that's interesting. And I think so. You know, on the one hand, we have these these tools being built that you know will make will make this uh, much more anonymous, much harder. And then I think I can totally see why, and I see a lot of value in that, and I, and I can understand that. And I think you know any one of us, uh, you know, since the Snowden cases, it's just uh, it's it's become extremely abundantly clear. That uh, surveillance is a huge problem, and uh, it's a, it's a huge threat, I think, to liberty and all. And then at the same time, um, you know, companies like like what you are doing, you know, that's just uh, there's just not not going to be any way to integrate Bitcoin uh, into the financial system or to have any kind of mass uh, mass use of cryptocurrencies without that thing either. You know, so and I think there's this sort of both. Are you know both in, inevitable, both a part of of uh, what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are, and, and I don't think either is uh, is going away. I agree. It's definitely it, it's uh, we will have to fight that dualism a long time from now because we don't we don't want the, the scenario of of, uh, of surveillance, and also we can't fight surveillance with regulation. It doesn't work that way. You need to fight it some somewhere some other by some other means. You need to ensure that you protect yourself against surveillance. It's pretty hard to do that. But, uh, and again, as you say, it will only be the savvy ones that can protect themselves against surveillance, and then they might end up become the, the ones that people question what, what their intentions are sometimes. So, it, so it's, uh, it's really a, a, a strange scenario. And again, you need, as you say, you need, you need tools for financial services for them to onboard uh, Bitcoin, and, and it's probably good that they onboard it. As I see it. Now I'm curious. Um, so I, I believe it was one of your co-founders who was involved with the Mycelium project. Yeah. Uh, in the past, and so since this whole story broke out, like they some sort of distance themselves uh, from what you guys are doing, even though your co-founder is still somewhat involved with the project as an advisor. Um, what are your thoughts on them, you know, distancing themselves from uh, what you guys are doing, where you well, still have ties with them? And such. I think that well, we both have uh, good connections back to to our former companies and talk to them well on a, almost on a daily basis in, in many ways. But but I think that definitely they should just distance themselves from, from this part. You don't want to to be subject of stuff like that. And you don't want to answer these questions. I think what we we done that we did this completely as as uh, analysis. That's how we. We, we present ourselves and uh, any association of, of uh, our uh, services towards mycelium or Kraken for that matter is not is not uh, justified in any way. So uh, beside from that, <laughs> there were some speculations. I think it was in Reddit or, or Bitcoin talk that what were happening here was was uh, 
was Mycelium trying to uh, to make it harder to use uh, Bread Wallet to gain some customers from Bread Wallet? <laughs> and I think that you, you mentioned this thing about assuming uh, well, assuming that someone is doing things in good faith first instead of assuming the opposite. I think this is definitely an example of it's just well, come on. It, yeah, that, that that does sound like a very absurd. Uh. <laughs> At least it's fun, but but it, again, it's it's just. It's not the case, and and uh, no, yeah. Well, uh, Michael, uh, thanks so much for coming on. It was very interesting to talk to you. Also, very interesting to dive a bit deeper into that story because obviously, reading the top Reddit comments always doesn't always give you uh, the most profound analysis. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic we we had a chance to cover here. I mean, I think as as we mentioned, this this duality between the need for privacy, the desire for uh, privacy and anonymity uh, is just so integral and so, so much part of Bitcoin. And then this need and desire to get integrated and acceptance and Bitcoin use and financial services is just as much part of Bitcoin and it's just as much yeah. part of the vision. And uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, uh, thanks so much for that discussion. Uh, I thought it was very interesting and very enjoyable. Definitely, likewise. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for coming on such short notice. Sure. Um, yeah, and uh, the listeners, thanks very much for listening. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at epicenterbtc, and uh, you can also leave us a tip if you want to. And uh, that's it. Uh, with with any of your unobtainium, Litecoin or or God knows or Potcoin, uh, and you can do that at epicenterbitcoin.com/tips. Yeah, so send us thanks. your Potcoins. Yeah, thanks so much, and uh, we'll be back next week.